Okay, chapter one. First peoples populating the planet to 10,000 BCE. All right, you should be able to familiarize yourself with the spread of human societies in the Paleolithic era. That's going to be predominantly uh, the era we will be covering or the Old Stone Age that we'll be looking at in chapter one. You should also be able to explore the conditions of life in gathering and hunting societies, which is going to set the stage for the beginning of our societies that will eventually lead to the agricultural revolution in your next objective for chapter two. And of course, uh, the ultimate aspect of your civilizations emerging into empires and dynasties. And you should be able to examine factors that eventually led to the change in the gathering and hunting societies. So kind of looking at our CCOT aspect of our essays, our change in continuity that people will have as uh, the world continues to move forward. The Hazda of Tanzania are one of the last gathering and hunting societies on Earth. More than likely, they're going to be disappearing very soon. But for the most part of uh, our history, you're looking at 95% of it, was a means of gathering and hunting. This is the important aspect here. Food collection, not food production. Please make sure you understand the difference of what was occurring in Chapter 1 to what you're about to see that is going to occur in chapter two. So this is food collection, this is our hunting, this is our gathering. And of course our second part, Paleolithic Old Stone Age as I had just mentioned. And here's an image of the Hazda of Tanzania, one of our few uh, remaining hunting and gathering societies. All right, it's wrong to ignore the first 200,000 years of human experience. Uh, this is where I like to just kind of pause, let you know, no matter what your belief is, uh, whether a secular belief or a religious belief, it's still important to study these aspects of history, either to um, reinforce your own beliefs or so that you are not ignorant in any kind of conversation, intellectual debate, or um, just any type of research you are doing. So it's important, no matter what your belief is, that we still study this aspect to have a better understanding uh, for going forward in our own intelligence, in our own conversations, in our own debates, in our own research that we're going to have. And so archaeology reveals a great deal about these people, and it helps set the stage for what is going to occur uh, down the line. So whether you agree with dating, disagree with dating, agree with some of these, uh, or realize that they're opinions, uh, just keep note that obviously some of this uh, may contradict or some of it might reinforce either way it's still going to help you learn and that's what is most important here they created the earliest human societies and they were the first to reflect on issues of life and death all right maps guys it is important it's imperative that you look at these maps i know most of you are thinking yes score map on this page i can skip the map look how much room i just saved that's two-thirds of the page that I don't have to read anymore and I can just skip down to two little short columns and get on to my next page one less page down and you're continuing to go but guys maps are huge they are important you're gonna see maps on the AP exam with multiple choice you might even see a map within the DBQ document uh, you could even see a map as some historical background for you for another one of the questions uh, for your essays but most importantly you are going to see a geographical location uh, in your other two essays, the Compare and Contrast and the CCOT. And you need to have a good grasp of understanding. Last year, one of the essays dealt with Eurasia. Students did not know Eurasia. When you're looking at this map, you're going to see Europe, you're going to see Asia, and I guarantee you right now, some of you aren't really connecting the dot. All right, Europe, all right, Portugal, all the way over to Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, that is South Asia with India, the Middle East, all of that is Eurasia. And a lot of times students kind of want to shrink that down to a much smaller size. So it's important that you understand your geographical terms, looking at uh, the areas that are required by the AP exam, which will be going over in class. But the maps you see in the book, it is important to study. Also note, I will be putting up maps um, that are not in the book as well, such as the next slide. So again, it's helpful when you're looking at these PowerPoints to go ahead and look at some of the other maps as well. As you note, this is uh, the map prior to this was more of a Eurocentric 
uh, theme, where this one more of a world theme here, having uh, Africa and Europe and Asia on the left-hand side if you're looking at it, and the uh, North America and South America region on the right-hand side. So kind of a flip, but this gives you more of a global perspective, so you can kind of see your land bridge that is occurring um, and also your sea routes of the Pacific, which is really your largest body of water. All right, Homo sapiens emerged in eastern and southern Africa 250,000 years ago. They, stared, they stayed there exclusively for about 150,000 years, and this is going to be more on that eastern portion, northeastern portion of Africa. So kind of uh, getting in, uh, bordering that uh, Red Sea, Indian Ocean region. Africa was home to the human revolution in which culture became more important than biology and shaping human behavior. Culture is going to be extremely important. It's going to tie in a lot of things with religion. It's going to tie into some aspects of uh, their social structure. It's going to tie into the uh, languages that we're going to study. It's going to involve um, rituals. Um, it's going to involve um, basically lifestyle itself, uh, clothing, food, uh, what um, and how that culture is uh, involved with the environment and the relation that it has there, especially with the hunting and gathering peoples and how they will uh, be in direct contact with that environment. It's going to involve their technology and the types of technology. We'll look at some people where they lived were using a different type of technology due to the environment they lived in. Uh, this will also involve patterns of exchange, one culture exchanging with another culture because this culture has developed something different and it is helpful to another culture. Or the environment that they live in, this culture has adapted this way because of the foods that grow here and another culture has adapted another way because of the animals that are in that region. And you, so you'll see some patterns of exchange. Uh, you'll also have uh, different cultures with their burials, as I said earlier, uh, touching on the basis of religion. And while religion early on is a little bit for debate and interpretation due to the lack of writing, still this kind of uh, gives us a better understanding of what was happening with some of these people groups. 100,000 to 60,000 years ago, beginning of migration out of Africa, we're going to go right into the Middle East, uh, which people will then spread uh, up into uh, the European region and, of course, over into your Central Asia, uh, over into northern parts of Asia and eastern Asia. And so as those two maps had just shown you. Uh, and adapted nearly to every type of environment um, and even took places in difficult areas uh, during the last ice age. Development of new technologies in the Ukraine and Russia. You're going to see needles, multi-layered clothing, weaving, nets, baskets, pottery. Sometimes we see these items as something that occurred during civilization, but even hunting and gathering societies had things with baskets, nets, pottery that was going to help them in their gathering and hunting. Uh, obviously, multi-layered clothing that you're going to see for your uh, colder regions, more northern regions and northern Europe. Uh, even um, parts of Europe today where it might be more warm were definitely cooler due to your climate at that time. So needles and weaving, it wasn't like they just took a knife or an arrowhead and ripped out a hole in your animal skin and put it over themselves. They're, they had the concept of uh, sewing and weaving things together and making clothing and making blankets and obviously uh, putting um, tents together that they were going to use. Partially underground dwellings made from mammoth remains. Uh, these were semi-permanent. Uh, Obviously, uh, there's a, a belief in cycles that we're going to see within uh, religion and culture. And the same thing uh, has a, a relationship to the environment and the migrations of animals. Uh, there is a cycle and a pattern in which a lot of animals are going to migrate in. And so you're going to see some semi-permanent areas where people might be traveling. And next season, they're back in that same location. Here's their semi-permanent uh, location, and they're going to settle in. And so they're kind of having an area, a large region. It's not like people aimlessly wandered the earth from point A all the way to point B. No, there was a point A, B, C, D, back to A, B, C, D, back to A, B, C, D. And so they were kind of going in a cycle here, uh, not just continuing to always travel east or always travel 
west or always travel north or always travel south. It wasn't like they were just going to keep on going until they reached the edge of the earth. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind when you're thinking about the, the movement of people. Uh, it wasn't just this kind of one-line direction. It was definitely a cycle that they had. Creation of the female figurines. Uh, a lot of historians uh, looking at how much uh, women were involved. A lot of people are going to say that women had more rights, more freedoms uh, earlier on in your hunting and gathering societies and are going to slowly continue to lose that into civilization. Here's an image of your um, Venus figurines. Uh, this is important to note. I know they look kind of funny, uh, but it has been on several AP exams before. I'll offer several uh, questions for you during our practice review times. And here's a map of where a lot of your uh, Venus figurines, your clusters of them, where they have been found uh, within the European region. All right, now we're going to go down into Australia. Humans reached Australia around 60,000 years ago from Indonesia. A very sparse settlement, estimated 300,000 people in 1788. So please note that date. Yes, 1788. That is 1788 AD or CE uh, for reading that correctly. And so uh, obviously in Australia we have a huge desert kind of in the middle there. So just like today, people living on the outskirts, same thing then, population a lot lower. Development of some 250 languages. We're going to see that all the way from Madagascar to the Pacific Islands. And so a huge impact on your languages dating even back to parts of China where that language base originated. Still completely a gathering and hunting economy when Europeans did arrive in 1788. And of course they have the complex worldview of the dream time. While we're not going to get a chance to go over our extra sources and documents in chapters 1, 2, and 3, uh, this is a very interesting one. Could see it as a question on your summer reading. I would kind of check over the dream time. Uh, it is a, a, a neat document that they have in there to study. But for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving forward. Major communication and exchange networks. And so sometimes I think we think, oh, there was this group of people and they just kind of wandered around and never bumped into anybody else. There were trade networks. They did trade certain things, including stones, pigments, wood, uh, even some hallucinogens with their drugs. And so, uh, but it wasn't just that as well. Even parts of cultures blended with each other with songs, dances, stories, rituals. Uh, you'll see a, a common theme within a lot of creation stories, uh, a lot of flood stories. Uh, there's obviously um, the rain dance. I know we kind of joke about that living here in Texas. Hey, anybody know a rain dance? But on a serious note, obviously these cultures, um, for one reason or another, uh, whether dance was part of a burial or a uh, ceremony or a uh, alms giving to a certain deity, uh, dance, very popular. Same thing with songs. And plus these songs and dances a lot of times told stories of their history. And so that would get passed down and even blended between some of these cultures. Here's that map going from Madagascar all the way over to your Pacific Islands. All right, into the Americas. So getting over into our Western Hemisphere here. When settlement of the Americas began, it is still argued over. Okay, so 30,000, 15,000 years ago. Listen, a long time ago. So it's okay. It's You're not going to see some question. Hey, was it 30,000 or 15,000? You're okay. Don't worry about that. Um, but note that it is kind of later in the process compared to our eastern hemisphere that we have. Mode of migration, the Bering Strait, as I had pointed out on that map that kind of gave more of a uh, world view where our hemispheres were kind of on the opposite sides than we're used to seeing here with the Eurocentric view. So keep that in mind, but that would help you with where the Bering Strait is all the way up near Russia over to Alaska. How many migrations and how long, obviously that is argued over as well. There is evidence of humans in southern Chile around uh, 12,500 uh, 12, years ago. Whether that was directly from the Bering Strait or even argued how long or how early did some of those Pacific Islanders really travel. A lot of people say it was more around 3,500 years ago, but there are some evidence people still reaching for it. Not a lot of concrete, but still, obviously, there is evidence of humans all the way down into South America along that Pacific coastline. All right, the Clovis. 
uh, which is mainly named after their arrowhead. That is what uh, different types of arrowheads a lot of times are going to be associated with that culture. Uh, if you ever get a chance, Native American classes, they're definitely one of my top favorite classes I took in college. Uh, just getting to learn about the different groups we had here in the Americas. So I'd highly recommend that. Uh, even if you're not a history buff, it's, there's some fun classes that you can uh, take, especially depending on the college. They might even have more of an emphasis on whichever Native American group was located where that college was. And so uh, very fun classes. I would check them out uh, when you get there. A couple years down the line, so you're all right. Flourished around 12,000, 11,000 years ago. Obviously hunted large mammals, mammoths, bison. Disappeared about uh, 10,900 years ago at the same time as the extinction, uh, the extinction of a number of large mammals. Uh, this could be for several reasons, either uh, due to climate change or obviously due to overhunting or a combination, combination of both. Most historians go with the combination of both. Uh, again, sometimes we think of, oh, these older hunting and gathering, so much respect for the environment and things like that. Yes, extremely. Uh, but obviously there were some instances of hunting these animals to their extinction as well. Next stage, much greater cultural diversity as people adapted to the end of the Ice Age in different ways. Again, that climate changing, uh, your clothing is going to change, the migration of the animals starting to change a little bit. Uh, what uh, items that you would be gathering, your berries, nuts, fruits, um, uh, leaves that you're gathering to use are going to slowly start to change. All right, here's a map of the uh, Clovis people uh, getting down into the Americas. Obviously, your area in uh, Missouri and Ohio and the Tennessee Valley are some of your more famous areas with some of the mounds that you have from the Clovis people, but... Uh, obviously, you can see uh, their ancestry uh, going throughout all of the Americas and influencing a lot of the major uh, Native American groups that we have. And here's your next map. Again, some of those Pacific Islanders coming over. Uh, you'll see the Bering Strait going up into the north region, coming on down into the Americas. And obviously, you have your sea routes as well. They did have uh, canoes at certain points, and they were going to follow the coastline as well, where they could find water sources, uh, little tributaries uh, that would have fresh water for them. All right, the second section, out of Africa to the ends of the Earth, first migrations. We're going to be looking at getting into the Pacific region now. So the last phase of the Great Human Migration started uh, circa, CA is circa, or around 3,500 years ago. Again, it's obviously nearly impossible to get an exact date here. So around 3,500 years ago. Migration by water from the Bismarck and Solomon Islands and the Philippines. Uh, some historians, uh, there's a great video on the History Channel uh, about uh, their boats and canoes that they were able to use. The speed and navigation skills of a lot of these islanders in this region are pretty phenomenal. The distance that they're able to cover in a length of time is, is phenomenal that they have. I mean, you're looking at all the way from Madagascar uh, all the way up to Hawaii. And again, there's some historians that are trying to connect them to parts of South America as well. So that um, Austronesian uh, language is going to spread pretty far. Uh, they settled every um, habitable area of the Pacific Basin within 2,500 years, which within history, that's uh, pretty quick that you're going to have, especially when you start looking at that section of history and its uh, time frame that's pretty fast to migrate throughout those areas. Also settled the island of Madagascar, as I just mentioned, and as we've already seen on that um, map, and of course all the way down to New Zealand as well, so kind of completing that around 900 CE, which that will get mentioned again uh, in a few chapters. The, uh, the Pacific settlers uh, took agriculture with them, and we'll be learning a little bit more about that in Chapter 2 as well. And here is that map once again to look at. Uh, again, this is a good map to look at and have a good understanding of uh, what is occurring here. All right, the first human societies, uh, this will be our third section, the ways we were. And so our societies were small bands of 25 to 50 people. 
obviously you don't want a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, a thousand people. That's going to be very difficult. They are taking everything with them. Even if they're semi-permanent, they're still going to be traveling. Imagine all of the people carrying all of the goods. They don't have domestication yet. It's, they're not using horses. They're not using camels yet. They don't have uh, a, a horse collar. They don't have a um, anything attached to a cow or anything like that. So they're they're hauling all this themselves, and so obviously your smaller bands of people are going to be able to uh, work together a lot better. You're also going to have low population. Imagine trying to feed that many more people. You're going to have to hunt more. You're going to have to gather more, and you're going to have to house more. That means more goods you're having to carry with you. And so uh, that's going to affect population, and obviously technology will affect it as well as those things I just mentioned that could aid them. Uh, with animals and technology with the animals combined. Very slow population growth, again, um, and, and the people knew this too. Um, your infant mortality rate, uh, your death in battles with each other in any, any type of collision, and of course uh, any accidents that were going to occur when you were on uh, the trails for hunting, and of course uh, on your migrations as well. Perhaps 10,000 people in the world around 100,000 years ago, we're going to see that increase. And then, of course, by 10,000, you will have around 6 million, and we'll be talking more about that in Chapter 2. All right, the Paleolithic bands were seasonal. Uh, they were mobile or nomadic, and they moved in regular patterns to exploit wild plants and animals. As I just mentioned, kind of that cycle. We're going to see things go in cycle. We have four seasons that we go by, uh, different plants and animals uh, in different parts of the region, and so they're going to be following that area. Since they moved around, they couldn't accumulate many goods, and so they weren't very materialistic. We'll see a, a James uh, Cook uh, quote uh, in the book, and we'll see one later, talking about how simple of a life that they lived. We'll also see that they're highly egalitarian, very uh, a lot of equality between man and women, even though they had different jobs. And yes, there was still some superiority with man just physically in that, but a lot more shared roles within leadership. And of course, that is dependent from culture to culture. That could vary a little bit there in certain degrees. Uh, obviously, certain job aspects. Some tribes did have women that uh, were part of their warrior class. And uh, there were some that were not. Obviously, some, some cultures had some social mobility and different social levels. Others, a lot more egalitarian in it and would even frown upon certain types of um, self-glorification within uh, a certain kill. If you had the largest kill that came in or killed so many in battle, they would kind of shame you so that way you never tried to rise above anybody else. Perhaps the most free people in human existence... Uh, did not have specialists, so most people had the same skill. So again, a lot more equality, not one person better than another person. Relationships between women and men were far more equal in later societies. Even some tribes and family units allowed women to have leadership roles. So a lot more freedom than what we're going to see in civilization down the road in chapters 2 and 3. James Cook, as I just mentioned, described the gathering and hunting peoples of Australia as tranquil and socially equal. So kind of continuing with that theme that I had just mentioned. All right, economy and the environment. Gathering and hunting peoples used to be regarded as primitive and impoverished, but really when you start looking at it, they worked less hours than we did. Yes, you might go and hunt for a week, every day straight out there might be pretty difficult but then you come back with food that's going to last you a month a month and a half and so you have a lot more downtime uh, it's kind of the same thing with gathering a lot of gathering is uh, taking place and then there's a lot more relaxation a lot more community that's where your stories come into play your dances and your songs come into play and raising children's as a uh, major unit than necessarily the individual family uh, but life expectancy was low, 35 years on average. Again, look at infant mortality, think about battles, think about travels as well. Yes, there were people who lived to be 50, 60, 70, um, but your average age, around 35. Alterations of natural environments uh, deliberately set fires to encourage growth of certain plants. Uh, this is kind of your slash and burn technique that we'll see later on in Chapter 2. But 
they obviously understood some science behind this. Uh, I mean, we can look at forests today where the sunlight does not reach the forest floor and there's less nutrients in the ground. There are less uh, types of life that animals would eat. And so there's less animals in that region, which means less fertilization going into the ground again. And so they would kind of set fire to some areas, clear them out, let that regrow. And they would find that the plants that they wanted and the animals they wanted would come back to that region. So they kind of had an, a concept and an understanding of how they could work with the environment. Extinction of many large animals shortly after humans arrived. And so obviously your, your hunting is going to play a role into that. Gradual extinction of other hominids and the Neanderthals and the, the florist man in Indonesia, uh, obviously an effect on uh, a stronger species than another. The realm of the spirit, so kind of getting into the religious theme here of uh, our scripted category that we'll be talking about and how we break up parts of world history. Uh, it is difficult to decipher the spiritual world of Paleothic peoples because we have a lack of writing. So, uh, and this is another debate. How much of this is really history? Does history start with writing? Uh, does history start with actual civilizations? Or is this part of history? Uh, but from what we do know from the writings that we do have and other cultures and seeing some similar aspects, we can kind of assume or make some opinions uh, that have some logical base to them about certain types of things. Obviously, art very subjective even to this day uh, with interpretation. Some artists leave it up to the people however they want to interpret it. Obviously certain artists do have a theme that they're going with. Same thing back then. We're looking at some art. Is this really art or is it them documenting things? Uh, some of those cave paintings are up for debate about what they are really trying to portray. Is this fertility? Is this um, a certain type of ritual to a deity? Or is this their, It's a map. Are they tracking animals? So some of that obviously still up for debate and interpretation. Paleothic peoples did have rich ceremonial lives, though. There's a lot of evidence in uh, certain areas that are found with burial remains and what those people are surrounded with. Uh, there's also evidence of your, your shamans, people especially skilled at dealing with the spirit world. Some of that dealt with your hallucinogens and your drugs that are going to be used. Uh, some of that with uh, the dances that are going to occur and some of that with the stories that are told. All right, apparent variety of beliefs. Some societies were seemingly monotheistic. We'll be studying that more in chapters 2 and chapters 3. Uh, others saw several levels of supernatural beings um, with multiple gods. Still others believed in impersonal force running throughout nature, like amonism or something like that. Uh, your Venus figurine still uh, up for debate. Is this more religious? Is this more uh, feminine? Uh, aspects of society does this have to deal with fertility uh, but either way kind of looked at in a little bit more of a religious uh, aspect there many peoples probably had a uh, a view of history within a cycle we'll definitely look at that within china which is very strong view of cycle with their mandate of heaven and son of heaven that they have There we go. Settling down, the great transition, gradual change as populations grew and climates changed and peoples interacted. This is a, a nice little section that's uh, showing the change that's occurring from chapter 1 to chapter 2. So when we talk about our change over time, this is a good one to see where some of our changes occur and even see where some of our continuities continue down the road. Collection of wild grain started in northeastern Africa around 1600 years ago. Uh, you're going to see global warming starting to occur, a richer and more diverse environment for human society as uh, different regions are going to have uh, a better climate now. Population is going to rise. Guys, this is key. So key. I don't know how to ingrain it into you. But where you see food production rise, you see population rise. Where you see food production struggle, you see population decrease. All right, so that is uh, really important to have a good understanding. It's a direct correlation. Anytime you're looking at a, a chart or a graph, students sometimes see those on multiple choice exams and they freak out or they see them on the DBQ and they just wig. Guys, slow down. Does it have to do with food and production? Okay, you already know what it's telling you. All right, if it's something else, we'll deal with it. We talk about those things in class. But right now, know that there is a correlation between population rise and food production. And of course, this is leading to the beginning of settlements. If you have more food production, you can stay in one area longer. 
All right, settlement led to societal change, larger and more complex societies starting to see some of those skills come to play, some of those social levels starting to come in, other people ranking them above uh, other parts of their culture and their group. Storage and accumulation for goods uh, led to inequality, some people having more items than others. Uh, we'll even see some areas that were settled from the beginning with the uh, Jomon people in Japan. We'll see some evidence in Scandinavia, Southeast Asia, North America, the Middle East. And so we're going to start to see this kind of start to spread throughout the globe during this time period and more settlements and uh, more material things, some equality within social levels and some equality within women, which I'll talk a little bit more about in Chapter 2. All right, here is uh, a typical looking uh, housing unit for uh, a culture that is starting to settle down within Japan. All right, comparing Paleolithic societies, I'm going to let you guys uh, study this part on your own. It's an example of pretty much everything I just talked about compared within these two societies. Make sure you read this section. Just because I'm not covering it in the lecture, I'm doing that to save some time. Some of these chapters I will continue on with those, but I will just go ahead and run through that for you, and you can look on the PowerPoint. I am going to go through each slide, but I'm only going to give you like two seconds on each slide here. And so that is going to conclude our chapter one uh, and their discussion.